But what is most interesting, once the lawsuit was dismissed, you know, their penny dollars they paid the kid, once that was done, what has happened since then? The federal government and the drug companies have all reached agreements that on these particular drugs now, these antidepressant drugs, they have to put all kinds of big notices, and that's the first big notice there is on the drug about how they cause suicide in children, so on and so forth, young people. You do know that, right? You can't pick any of those major ones now that isn't there. And uh, I have no doubt that someday, and this is my opinion, so district court officials, you can't do anything. This is my belief and opinion, personal, okay, from just everything. I have no doubt that uh, the drugs were a major, major factor in this boy committing suicide and, contrary to what most people maybe know or think, executing his own buddy, uh, Klebold there, <laughs> killing him when Klebold didn't want to die. Uh, and you just had to see all these basement tapes they made and know the whole story, and you'd have no doubt. But those are the things they won't release or let the public have and they keep talking about destroying and I don't know how much has been destroyed now, but if you ever saw those basement tapes and all that stuff, you would have no doubt. That no, I thought the official story was that they each committed suicide individually. And my answer to that is bullshit. See, Mr. Harris, the boy, had learned to manipulate even the drugs, double up and triple up, and then go off them for a few days. And, and, and get the exciting effects of this and that and feel like King Kong, you can kill anybody. And he, he learned the whole mechanism. And Has the, any of that ever come out? No. In the video games? The video games, of course, he, uh, my lawsuit also involved that, by the way. How they, they lived and breathed uh, those video games. They, they were real for them. Tell me about uh, your recent election, because you ran for a uh Nebraska Senator. Oh, I stupidly. Oh, six, right? Yeah, put my name on the ballot. Just for the heck of it. What? I didn't really do any campaigning. I just thought I'd try to get back into politics, and then I had a back surgery, and that pretty well made me lay low and stay out. But whatever. but the uh, polling had you go. The polling had me all. Sixty-eight percent or number something. Number one, number one, number one, number one, and uh, yes, I lost. Good. But only in those precincts that have electronic that's, voting machines. That's true. Only in precincts with electronic voting machines and the ones where it's hand counted and all that, I won like two to one or more. Paul Benassi uh, has married, has two beautiful children, uh, keeps in touch with me every once in a while, and uh, he's a fine young man. Uh, Rusty Nelson? Rusty, uh, he was the central photographer, you know, and he skipped out and escaped. And uh, he ended up in prison in Oregon, and uh, that's when I got a call from one of the top detectives there, and they said, do you ever hear of a guy named Rusty Nelson? I said, yeah, this is way at the height of the Franklin thing. I said, yeah. I said, are you de camp? And I go, of course, you know. He says, well, what do you know about him? I said, well, I, I know nothing other than <coughs> he was involved in this Franklin thing. And uh, so uh, I, I said, why? And they said, well, we arrested somebody, and he has this book called The Franklin Cover-Up. It was my first edition when I first, and he says, and he's got all these parts underlined that mention him. It's, I said, holy mackerel. And they said, so I went out and saw him. Interview. And that's the first time you? Absolutely. And he spilled everything to me, which I was able, of course, to had more to the book, and he had, they had seized tens of thousands of pictures, and they let me look at those. <clears throat> then I tried to get them, and no, and then other people stepped in, and I think they've got them destroyed by now. But that was then, the next thing I did, the most important thing then, was I got Rusty Nelson out of prison back to testify in the case involving a lawsuit against Larry King, and he actually was able to get some of his secret pictures he had hidden in different places of Larry King and various other things. And that's how we into the court yeah, record. ended up doing big things along with another key witness in that case, uh, Noreen Gosh, in the famous Gosh case, you know, the first boy that his mother had led the effort to get pictures of 
kidnapped her children on milk cartons, you know, and uh, became very active because her, this Paul Benassi had described how he was involved in the kidnapping of this boy back when they were both 12 years old. They used one boy as, you know, kind of a, the bait. The other Bonassi boy, I mean, the, the gosh boy was out delivering papers, and there's Paul Bonassi uh, out there, 12 year old kid, too, and they stopped, and then these men grabbed him, and Paul told everything and described it. And uh, to make a long, long story short, uh, the gosh family, I wrote him in contact and said, I don't know if any of this is true, this strange, weird story, but if you'd like, so they came, they interviewed That was your initial contact with Noreen Gosh? Was no, that's even more sinister and strange. That was my initial contact with, quote, I'll use the phrase, the Gosh family. Uh, with the father, let's say. And because he kept a lot of evidence from Noreen for years. I'm not going to go into that. Now, these boys ended up supposedly on a, a ranch in Colorado. Uh, that's correct. Uh, Colonel Michael Aquino's ranch? Do you know? I, I, I'm not going to go into who owned or didn't own ranches or anything. Uh, Michael Aquino is prominently mentioned in my book. Michael Aquino was a very prominent individual, as you know, in the military, and uh, he's been accused of many things, including uh, being involved in this type of activity. I had, a, I was scheduled for a debate with him in California. They were going to have him on the radio very prominent station out there to refute and discount and disprove all kinds of things that were being claimed about him at the time. Not in my book, but all in lots of things. You remember? Lots of accusations were made. And I, unknown to him, was brought in by the radio station to be sitting there ready to debate with him. I didn't know that. Oh yes, this is a real event. And at the last minute, he finds out that I'm there. So he refuses then to participate further and quits. And I offer all kinds of things that clearly prove he's full of you know what. Yeah. I haven't had an Oxycontin or even a pain pill in two, two and a half months now. I literally, on the spot, said I'm not going to take another one and I don't want you giving me any more shots or anything else. And I never had a single thing from that day forward. I knew something was wrong. My entire office staff was telling me, you're flaky. And so how long did, did you feel like it, like it got... I'd it? say 13 days I thought I had been dropped in the middle of hell. When we had the showdown uh, with the doctors, and they were the ones that told me, legally, technically, we think you're addicted because we've put too much in you. Because we addicted you. Because we addicted you. Yeah, they made no question about that. Because I didn't take any excess. I just took what the nurses poured into me and everything else. Old doctor says, you know, that's the same thing they had Rush Limbaugh on. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, so why'd you put me on? He said, well, it's the best thing there is for killing pain. And you had more pain than anybody I've ever known. You know, my scar is literally three feet long. Goes from my neck down to my you-know-what at the bottom. Yeah. And, uh... Still hurts like a blankety blank, but like. But you have not. flexibility. You can actually. Well, that was why they did this surgery because it was either that or a wheelchair. And I said, take the risky one. Let's do it that way, and it's worked out. It's still a lot of pain, but I'll live with it. You think it'll get but better? I learned a lesson. Stay out of wars in places like Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> we should all heed that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, speaking of Vietnam, what what point did you um, gather around the table at the peace talks? Oh, this was in the 70s. Well, hell, it might have been in the 80s even. Started out a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, a Vietnamese friend who happened to be the son of the man who had been elected president and then was assassinated. Elected president of Vietnam. Vietnam, okay. He then and his family pretty well escaped to Paris. What's his name? His name was Tran Van Tong. Tran Van was obsessed with getting the story of the Vietnam War and, and things like what happened to his father and who really did what and everything else out. And so he organized this thing for Paris at exactly the same place and at the same table that they had originally done the Paris Peace Talks. 